Okay, good afternoon, Icon Church. Are you ready to worship the Lord with us? Yes. Um, this week I was uh, watching <laughs> The Chosen a lot. I think I um, was watching The Life of Jesus. And many things uh, got me impressed in the show. But one thing specifically was um, how the nature of Jesus, uh, how he handle situations and still his merciful soul to to those who did not understand what was happening and i was trying to think about bible verses that would uh, show jesus power and he's mighty uh in this song we're gonna sing psalm 46 is a really good display of jesus in god and his power but then i think the spirit was talking to me about um, the biggest thing that jesus did was to rescue us from sin so i'm gonna take this from Colossians uh, 1, verse 13 and 14 that says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. This is uh, the biggest display of power uh, of God himself, who decided to step down from his glory to save us from our sins. So let's stand up and sing a song about God who is mighty God, but in whom all the glory belongs and for who we worship right now. Let's see. Oh, come behold the words of God and reach his hands. He breaks the bow and bends the spear and tells the word to sins. Oh, mighty one, faith in God who burns the chariots with fire. Lord of hosts, you lead us, we descend the fire, we us as a shelter, we descend the storm. Send the 
today for our moment of prayer, we want to say thank you to God. We wanted to worship Him through prayer and a prayer of gratitude for everything He's done. For taking us from Dave's living room, from, his, from the heart that He gave Him, and bring us here together to worship. So many things happen. People who came, people who left, new people who has come here. We just need to say thank you to God. It's His ministry, His will. Before we pray, I want to give us an opportunity to say thank you to God for who He is. So I'm going to read from Psalm 136. If you see there, there there's the yellow part. I want us, I know that we are few people here, but I want us to shout the reason we are worshiping God. So the yellow part is going to be the church, and I want us to repeat that. As I read, give thanks to the Lord for He is good. Can you read that? For he is steadfast love. And give thanks to the God of gods. For he is steadfast love. And give thanks to the Lord of lords. For he is steadfast love. To him who alone does great wonders. To him who by understanding made the heavens. It is he who remembered us in our lowest state. Come on, let's say it. And rescue us from our foes for his steadfast love. He who gives food to all flesh. Give thanks to the God of heaven for his steadfast love endures forever. Let's pray as a church for his steadfast love endures forever. Jesus, it was out of love. A love that we, we did not deserve and we cannot comprehend. Maybe one day when we know you for who you are. Lord, help our heart. Increase our faith. Help us to act in love and gratitude. You have said so many times that you would take care of us. That you would be with us. For us to be courageous, for us to bring and walk in power of the Holy Spirit to do the things you call us to do. It's not about the things we're capable to do, but as the one who called. We see that over and over and over again in your word, and we still doubt, so help us in our faith. Jesus, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for uh, being here with us as we gather together to worship your name. We just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everything. We love you, Lord. It's your, in your name I ask. You. Amen. Guys, let's have a moment for fellowship. Um, please say hello to one another. Let's uh, be warm about it. Let's uh, spend a time talking to one another. Amen. And at the same time, I want to dismiss the kids. Go with Michelle to the right side here. Thank you, Michelle. Good afternoon. Uh, I'll be reading from uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the chosen who are residing temporarily in the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, 
according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and for sprinkling with the blood of Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Amen. We're adjusting, guys. Hold on. <laughs> all right. Not the way we pictured the transition. It's all good. <laughs> all right. You guys out there? You guys doing good? All right. Our first normal service here at Legacy. So excited for it. Hey, it was an amazing public launch weekend last week. And uh, really, I was running around like a chicken with its head cut off, and I did not know what I was doing. But I was just so grateful for our church, so grateful for the team and how you guys worked and put together all those uh, stands and signs and welcome people. We were just one big welcome team for every single person that came in. You guys did, ph you guys did phenomenal. Can we just take a moment and celebrate the team and one another? Okay, let's give a hand to the team. Woo-hoo! All right. All right, you guys did awesome. And it, here's the thing. You guys are still sitting in, like, the middle and back, and the light is, like, hitting right in my face. So I can't see you guys back there. So <laughs> so maybe in the future we can kind of come up a little bit closer, okay? All right. Um, but anyways, just so grateful for each of you. Uh, as we normally do, let's pray as we begin. Take a moment to pray first for yourself. Let's take a moment to just pray for yourself your own heart. May the Lord speak to you today through his word. And then if you could pray for your brothers and sisters around you, that they may also hear from the Lord and be encouraged by him today. And lastly, pray for me. That my words would be his words and my thoughts would be his thoughts. Now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer in whom we trust. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. So church, as we uh, begin our first normal service here at Legacy, we're actually going to be kicking off a new series from the letter, the first letter from Peter. And the title is going to be Misfits, Exiles with Hope. And we're going to unpack over the next about 15 weeks uh, what we mean by that. How many of you guys know that when you said yes to Jesus, the way of Jesus, you were also saying no to the way of the world. Your identity has dramatically shifted. Welcome, you are all misfits. You are all outsiders. You have all become minorities in the kingdom of the world. But... As, we will, as we're going to see over the next several weeks, we have become misfits in the world, but we are not misfits without hope. We have a living hope that Jesus has given us, a new community of God that we are a part of. Regardless, from every nation, tongue, and tribe, we are in this together. And we're going to unpack the beauty of that and the hope of that uh, together as a church, okay? So I'm excited for it. Uh, uh, Pastor Mitchell is going to be coming and sharing from the word here over the next couple of weeks uh, off First Peter. And so encourage him, all right? This is going to be his first time on this stage. So let's make sure we give him a, a word of encouragement and uh, some energy boost, all right? All right. So, but today I get the, uh, out of all sections, the most exciting section in the letter, which is the salutation, verse 1 through 2. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So this is Peter's hello, right? This is him saying his formal hello to, the, to these exiles, to the recipients of the letter. And he ends it by saying, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now it's interesting. Peter calls himself, out of all things, he says, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. In our time today, what I want to do is this. I want to spend some time looking at Peter's journey. 
from where he was and what he was before Jesus to now what he is in Christ, an apostle. What was his journey? In other words, we're going to hear Peter's life story today as we introduce the letter of 1 Peter. All right? So if you have your Bibles, actually turn with me to John 21. John 21. John 21 is kind of where we're going to camp out today. And we're going to hit at different points of his life, Peter's life, through John 21. Now today what we're going to do is look at John 21 to get a picture of Peter's story. And then from that, we're going to glean a principle about Jesus and about ourselves. And from that principle, we're going to look at how this principle, this truth, radically transforms our lives today. All right? Someone try to join the Wi-Fi. All right, cool. <laughs> Thank you, Apple, for that. All right. Um, Wi-Fi password sharing. All right. John 21, verse 1 through, we're going to read first from 1 through 3, okay? It says this, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the sea of Tiberias, and he re revealed himself in this way, Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. They went out, got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. All right, how exciting. Okay, all right. So John tells us that this is after seeing the resurrected Christ. Later on, we're going to find that this is actually, the disciples had already seen Jesus two times, his, the resurrected king two times, okay? So after seeing the resurrected Jesus, out of all things that they can do, Peter decides to go fishing. Some of you guys are like, what's wrong with that? I love fishing. <laughs> but Peter decides this is the thing he's going to do, out of all things, so the question for me was, why did Peter choose to go fishing after seeing Christ's resurrection? There's two reasons I want to unpack for us today. First reason is this. In his eyes, Peter was a minister who had fallen from grace. He has seen himself as being disqualified from his calling. Peter has seen himself as being disqualified from his calling. As an apostle. We know that for the last three years before this, Peter has spent life day after day with Jesus. He had walked with Jesus. And, and over, that, over that time, Peter had his shining moments and he had some, some not so good moments, right? Mostly for his mouth, okay? There's some people who just can't help just saying what they feel like saying at the moment. They can't help themselves, all right? But Peter, we see that. He, that's his personality, Peter had his good and his bad over the last three years, but eventually, during Jesus' darkest moment, during Jesus' greatest time of need, Peter publicly, vehemently denies Jesus three times. Right? I like what Adam, one of our church members, actually wrote on her article. She says this about Peter's denial. Based out of Luke 22, 54 to 62, she says, first, when Peter, in Peter's first denial, Peter denied his relationship with Jesus. I don't know him. Second, in his second denial, Peter denies his community with the other believers. I'm not with those people, right? And lastly, in his third denial, by denying the fact that he was a Galilean, Peter denies his very identity. So if he first denies his relationship, then his community, and lastly, his identity. In other words, Peter had totally, completely, publicly denied his faith. If TMZ or Twitter was on back then, this would have been scandalous. This would have gone viral, right? One of the biggest leaders of Jesus' movement has denied Christ, says he, he's a fake. This was serious i mean we like to hate on judas and i get that but guys we can't take what peter did here lightly either right this is a public denial 
from Jesus' right-hand man. Peter had fallen, in his eyes, fallen from grace permanently. P Peter knew the ramifications, how serious it was to de deny Jesus, right? Jesus said it um, in Matthew 10, th verse 33, he says, Whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. This wasn't just once. Peter had heard this over and over and over again. In his eyes, he was now a man who Jesus would deny before God. Do you guys, can you guys feel the shame? The failure, the guilt that Peter must be feeling in that moment. The permanence, the hopelessness that Peter must feel. I have fallen from grace. We guys know, you guys know of celebrity pastors who fell from grace. Guys who, you know, got caught in scandal. And how devastating that is to the, their church, their own family, and even to their own life. We know this is not a light matter. Peter saw himself as someone who was a failure, a goner, a royal screw-up with no chance for hope, no chance for restoration. He had fall, fallen completely from grace. Let me ask you guys today, can any of you relate with Peter? Have you ever felt like God cannot use you, God God, Jesus would deny you because you had denied him. Have you ever felt that kind of shame and guilt over your sins or your past? Do you feel like you are someone who is shackled by your shame? You feel your shame, especially when you try to pray. You ask yourself, why would God even care? Why would he even listen to someone like me? You feel your shame when you try to worship and your hands just don't go up because you feel so much guilt. You feel so much shame in your community group that you can't even share what's really going on in your life right now. You only tell people what is the surface. You can't tell them what's really going on. The pain, the guilt that's crippling you. Day in and day out. Week in and week out. Right now, some of you guys, as I'm talking about this, your blood pressure is rising because this is you. This is how you feel. You hear about this thing called freedom in Jesus Christ, but you feel like it's, it's impossible for you. Because you have fallen from grace. If that's you, Peter knew how you were feeling today. Peter was there with you. And Peter just decided, you know what? This is too hard. I'm too much of a goner. I'm too much of a failure. I am just going to walk away and go fishing. So the first reason why Peter decides to go fishing after seeing the resurrected Jesus is because he saw himself as disqualified and fallen. The second reason why Peter decided to go fishing, out of all things, is because he used to be a fisherman before Jesus, right? This was his old trade, his old way of life, right? Luke, uh, Luke 5, Matthew 4 tells us that before joining Jesus' mission, Peter was a fisherman. He was a common man. He was an uneducated man. Later on in the book of Acts, it, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, when they see John and Peter, go, man, who are these unlearned, uneducated, elementary school level people who are talking so boldly? about Jesus Christ with a knowledge of the word, they were shocked, right? Because Peter was just a common, uneducated man. But here we see in this part of the story that Jesus, uh, that Peter goes back to fishing. In other words, Peter has simply gone back to his old way of life before Jesus, to his old calling, his old identity. Some of you guys in this room as you're trying to serve God, as you are trying to be faithful, as you're doing ministry, have you ever felt tempted to just go, go back to your old way of life? To just call it quits? I'm not going to lie. Church planting is hard, right? 
there's so, there are several days, y'all, at least one day a week where I'm kind of going like, is this worth it? <laughs> you know what, especially, you know, you know when I struggle with this is when I find myself comparing myself with other people. You guys, am I the only one guilty of that? <laughs> I like how we're talking back now. Okay, okay that's good. We got to keep doing that more, right? When I found myself, oh, someone else, one of my peers, a pastor or whoever, he, he bought a house, right? He went on a trip. And, he, and I hear I, I'm, I'm a church planter, and I'm like, we, got, we ain't got money for that, <laughs> right? And you feel tempted to kind of just call it quits, to just throw in the towel. This is too hard. This is too much sacrifice, right? There's a temptation in us to just walk away. To just call it quits. Or maybe like Peter, some of you have had the temptation of what would it be like if you were no longer a Christian? If you no longer pursued Jesus? If you no longer lived your faith? How much easier would life be? Have, have any of you ever tried that before? I remember during college, I tried. First year of college. My parents are here, so this is kind of a confession. All right? <laughs> but here's the thing. Here's what I found. You know how, like, Peter and the disciples went and tried to go fishing, and they caught nothing? That's kind of how I felt. It, it felt I was, like, trying to go back to go to this other life, trying to experiment, trying to live without Jesus, and then I found it to be unsatisfying and empty. It was not, it, the, all the, the pleasure that, 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 way of life had promised to me was found vain and void. I couldn't go back. It was either Jesus or nothing, right? Maybe some of you guys have had that temptation. But in all this, by going back to fishing, the author is telling us Peter was trying to go back to his old way of life, his old identity. Now that he had fallen from grace in his eyes, he was trying to go and find some other way. But then let's see what happens. Verse 4, it says this. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast a net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, this is John, okay, therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have ca just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. And now none of the disciples dared even ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus revealed to, to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So we see Peter trying to go back to his old life and even inviting some of the other disciples to go along with him, including John, right? But what we see in the story in verse 4 is that Jesus decides to stage a divine intervention. We see him setting the scene in John 21 in a way that actually is a flashback to Luke 5 when Peter was originally called. Now, for the sake of time, we're not going to look at Luke 5. I'm just going to summarize three key similarities that we see in Luke 5 and John 21. The first similarity is this. In both scenes, the disciples fished all night without catching anything. Second similarity, Jesus, after a full night of failure, failure Jesus tells his disciples to go fish, to cast the net again on the other side. And lastly, we see the disciples miraculously catching so many fish that they were barely able to haul it in. It says 153 large fish. How many of you guys like fishing in this room? One, two, two, three. Okay, four. All right, we're going to need to work on this, okay? I, by the way, I don't like, I don't 
me and I'm not an adventurous person. I've only really gone fishing once in my life, right? And I was too scared to like hold on to the fish. This is another confession, right? But I've seen, I, I went and we had a, Alex Mercado, my best friend for his party, we had a bachelor party. We, want, we went fishing on a charter boat in Chesapeake Bay and we caught rockfish. How many of you guys know what rockfish is, right? It's about like my, this, this side, the, the length of my arm. So as I'm reading this, 153, I'm kind of imagining to myself, 153 rockfish hauling that in. How ridiculous and crazy would that be to catch that many fish? How exciting would it be? They were barely able to haul it in. So let me ask, why did Jesus create a scene that is a flashback to Luke 5. Why, why make that connection for the disciples and for Peter? You see, Luke 5 was the first time, it, it captures the first time Peter was called into ministry. This is the time where Jesus invites Peter and Peter gets on his knees and he says, Lord, be gone from me, be far from me. I am a sinful man. The shame that Peter felt when he first was called into ministry, Jesus is giving him a flashback to that moment. And Jesus at that moment invited him. No longer will you just be catching fish. Now, Peter, you will be catching men. I'm calling you into mission. I'm calling you into purpose. Jesus was bringing Peter back to that original place where he first was called into a new identity. And I love what, what, what's the story, how the story continues here, because Peter and the disciples are going crazy, trying to haul all this fish in. Peter is like trying to swim in the water, and they're all going to the shore. And what is Jesus doing, y'all? It says Jesus, like a boss, was just cooking some fish. He was cooking breakfast. He was just chilling, cooking breakfast. Now, I'm just thinking to myself, if I was Jesus, the last thing I would want to do is cook breakfast for people who just denied me. Like literally, the disciples, not just Peter, all the disciples had run away from Jesus. All the disciples had disowned Jesus in his greatest time of need. And we see Jesus here in this story just cooking them breakfast, killing them with kindness, right? They're all coming. And he's just going, come eat. Come bring some of that fish you just caught. Come eat. Can you imagine how shocking and disorienting this would be for Peter? To see Jesus cooking him breakfast. Do you think this would remind him of the time that Jesus washed his feet? Jesus, I'm not worthy of this. I'm not worthy of you serving me. And here you're, you're serving me fish. This would have been ridiculous for him. Some of you guys are looking at me a little funny. So I, 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 was, I was thinking about this kind of act of kindness. Uh, I was thinking actually about my wife and I. So sometimes, uh, you know, have you guys heard that story or heard that biblical principle, you know, in marriage of like, hey, don't go to sleep angry. Right? Don't go to sleep angry. No matter how bad it gets, no matter how much you argue, make sure that you pray and, and reconcile before you go to sleep. And, you know, don't let the sun go down on your anger. I'm going to confess, the two of us, we've, breaking that, we've broken that a lot of times, right? Um, it's okay, we're the only ones. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, sometimes, you know what, we know what's right. Like, I know I should apologize, I just don't feel like it. You know what, some days I'm just like, forget that, right? Uh, I know what's the right thing to do. I know I should humble myself. I know we should pray. I just don't feel like it. Sometimes in my flesh, my weakness, I just go, you know what, no, forget it. We're just going to not talk to each other, go to sleep. But you know what's really disorienting for me and humbling for me? Is that the next morning when we wake up and my wife apologizes to me and gives me breakfast. I'm not even sure, she does that. And I'm not even sure what, how to respond. Like, what do I say? Like, do I apologize? Do I, do I just, do I not receive the food? Do I take the food, right? Because it's disorienting. But what is she doing? She's knocking me out with kindness. That's what she's doing. She's <laughs> right? that's, that's what she's doing. Right? She's doing what Romans said. 
heap coals on their head, right? <laughs> Love, you know what I mean? But uh, it's okay, all right? There's a kindness that Jesus shows to his disciples and to Peter here that is disorienting, but that's bringing him back into a relationship with him. And I can't help but wonder if Peter felt like I did, right? Let's continue in the story, verse 15. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Verse 17, he, Jesus, said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. The very same words he said to Peter in Luke 5. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So in this story, part of the story, we see Jesus and Peter having a much-anticipated come-to-Jesus meeting, right? With this question lingering, what will Jesus say to Peter? Out of all things, what will Jesus finally say? This is their first one-on-one -on -one conversation. What will Jesus say? And it's interesting. Out of all things, Jesus could say, he didn't say, Peter, are you sorry? Peter, what's wrong with you? Peter, you're a goner. You got no hope. No, Jesus asked the question, Peter, do you love me? He doesn't just ask that question once. He asks it three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you think, why do you think Jesus is asking Peter three times, do you, is he trying to be annoying? My wife told me that, because I, I, I ask her sometimes every day, I love you, do you love me? I love you. She's like, that's annoying. Don't stop knocking, knock, that, knock off doing that, right? <laughs> is Jesus trying to do what I did, right? Because he's insecure? No, <laughs> right? There's a purpose. You guys, are, you guys are knowing too much of my stories here. It's because you guys are far. Um, <laughs> no, no. Uh, no. Jesus has a purpose for asking Peter three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And what is Jesus doing with each of these questions? He's giving Peter a chance to reverse his denial. And for every single time Peter denied Jesus three times, do you know him? No, I don't. I'm not one of his. I have no association with him. For every single time Peter denied Jesus, Jesus is asking Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? In other words, through this conversation, Jesus is restoring Peter's relationship with him. He's restoring his community. He's restoring Peter's purpose, his identity. Three times, just in case, just to be clear to Peter, because just in case Peter wonders, hey, maybe I, I was restored, you know, that for that first question, but those two other questions, eh. No, Jesus wants to make it absolutely clear. Peter, for every single time you, you denied me, I have restored you. There's no question, no doubt, I am calling you, follow me. Follow me. There's a couple other things that Jesus does here. 
He says, Peter, do you love me? Then what? Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. So what is Peter doing? He's saying, Peter, if you love me, you will love the people that I love. Peter, if you love me, you will love my church. You will love the flock. Listen, there's a lot of people today that say, I love Jesus, I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, but I really hate the church. The church, it's messy, it's ugly, it's messed up. And, and I get it, I used to be one of those people. I'm not saying this because I think I'm, I'm better. But look at the story here, what is Jesus saying? You cannot love me if you don't love the church, my bride, my family. Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Take care of the people that I've entrusted to you. In other words, y'all, we cannot say we love Jesus if we hate our brothers and sisters in this room. We cannot say we love Jesus if we mistreat the people here. Every single person here, a child, an elderly person, no matter what race, no matter what background, they are worth dignity in Christ. And we are called, because we love Jesus, we are called to love each of them like we would love Jesus himself. Jesus says in other texts, whatever you do unto the least of these, you do unto me. Right? He calls Peter, if you love me, Peter, then you will love the people that I love. I'm entrusting these people back to you. Do you remember, in the, in the text here, it's interesting. He calls first Peter Simon. This was from Matthew 16. Do you guys remember this? Right? Jesus, in Matthew 16, renames Simon Peter from Simon to Peter. He gives him a new name and calls him to lead the church. Here in John 21, what we're seeing is a restoration of that call. Peter, you have a choice. Are you going to be Simon, the fisherman? Or are you going to be Peter, who's going to care and build up my bride, the church? Peter, it's you. But if you love me, you will love the church. You will cultivate, you will care for the church. Lastly, Jesus foretells Peter's eventual death. He says that the very thing that Peter failed in doing, which was denying Jesus publicly, that eventually Peter will be successful and it will lead him to his death. Right? We know from history of the church that Peter did indeed fulfill this calling by being publicly crucified upside down on the cross in Rome, somewhere around A.D. 64 and A.D. 68. This was a foretelling of that. But I love how Peter ends, I'm not going to read it, but it's hilarious. He ends in the most Peter-like way. So Jesus says, hey, Peter, you're going to die for me. And Peter, Peter goes, okay, but what about him? <laughs> right? Like, what about John? Right? Uh, and Jesus, Jesus just kind of says, mind your own business. <laughs> right? This is like the most Peter way to wrap it up. One moment you're saying something serious and profound. I love you, Jesus. And the next moment you're going, what about this guy? All right. Uh, but we know that eventually Peter did, in fact, lay down his life for Jesus. And we also know that in the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, Peter, the one who denied Jesus, who tried to hide, who tried to run, rises up. And is the first spokesman for the church. And he preaches the gospel with power and authority. And 3,000 people come to know Christ. Over the span of like 50 days, right? Like this is a radical transformation. Grace has reversed Peter's denial. And so in all this, then it brings us to this principle. Through Jesus' response to Peter's failures, we see one clear principle in action. This is what I need you to get today, if you don't get anything else. 
This is the principle. No matter how far you've run or how deep you've fallen, there is no place where the grace of God cannot reach you. No matter how far you've run or how deep you've fallen, there is no place where the grace of God cannot reach you. In other words, for a Christian who has genuinely accepted Christ, even if you stumble, even if you fall, even if you struggle, even if you are right now addicted to something, struggling with something, there is no place where the grace of God cannot reach you. In other words, you, Christian, cannot fall from grace. You may fall from a position. You may fall from a title. You may fall. You may suffer the consequences of your actions. But you cannot fall from the grace of God. The grace of God is there to catch you. Now let me be clear. God's grace doesn't mean that you can just go and wild out and do whatever you want. This is grace without compromise. Jesus clearly knew and called out Peter's denial. And yet he chose to love him anyway. This is grace without compromise. And this is what we see from Jesus in this story. Think about how Jesus shows Peter extravagant, mind-blowing grace. Peter had ditched him. Peter had denied him. Peter had run back to his old way of life, even when he knew that Jesus was alive. And the text never tells us that Peter came back and apologized to Jesus. Never says that Peter tried to reconcile with Jesus or tried to get it right with Jesus. No, Jesus pursued Peter. Even when Peter didn't deserve it. Why? Because Jesus' relationship with Peter was not, and his calling for Peter in ministry was not based on how good and how worthy and how capable Peter is. His relationship with Peter was based on his grace. Undeserved grace. Let me ask you, church, do you believe this for you? Do you believe today that no matter how far you've run or how deep you've fallen, that there's no place in your life where the grace of God cannot reach you. Do you believe in the grace of God for yourself? I gotta be honest, I struggle, guys. I struggled to comprehend this grace. I struggle because I know all too often how I fail, how I stumble, how I am lacking. I see my imperfections daily. I see how unworthy I am daily. Even as a pastor, I, I, I got to say, pa being a pastor is not easier. It's harder because I don't want to let you guys down. I see all my brokenness, all my lacking. But it, it is in these moments where I have to preach to my own heart day in and day out. Dave, you are not here because you are worthy. You are here. You are called by grace. Because Jesus has shown you grace. And you guys have been a living testament of that grace towards me. When I'm lacking, you guys are encouraging when I'm struggling, you guys pick me up. I know you guys are praying for me. And it carries me when days are hard. Guys, do you believe in the grace of God for you? How tragic would it be if we are preaching this beautiful gospel and yet you don't, you do this for others, but you don't believe it for yourself. If you're still trying to work, be good enough, or serve hard enough to just earn God's approval, 
to earn God's love? Do you believe, church, in the grace of God for you? We see in this story, instead of treating Peter with bitterness or resentment, Jesus chooses to respond to Peter with grace. He pursues Peter, even when he knew that Peter was going to hurt him. This is why we have a line at Icon, we say, when we're cut, we're going to believe the gospel. We're already, we already know that we're going to get cut. When you're in a relationship with people, they are going to hurt you. They're going to disappoint you. But when they do, we already choose in advance that we're going to respond with grace. We're going to fill that gap behind, be, between expectation and reality with the grace of God. I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep it together. Okay. <laughs> The story of Peter, the story of Peter is a story of a broken, fallen man, just like you and me, the common man, who was both called and carried by the life-transforming grace of Jesus Christ. Jesus is a hero of Peter's story, and he's a hero of our story as well. Jesus knows, church. All the sins that we have committed, all the sins that you are struggling with now, all the sins that you will, you will fail in in the future. Jesus is not taken by surprise by your sin. But Jesus, in ways we cannot understand, he chooses to love you and me anyway and pursue us anyway and restore us to himself even when we don't deserve it. And just as he showed grace to Peter and his disciples, he is extending his grace to you today. Brothers and sisters, we have been pursued by grace, loved by grace, forgiven by grace, called by grace, grown by grace, empowered by grace. And we will be sustained by grace to that fateful day when Jesus calls us home. We are called and carried by the grace of Christ. This is not our own works so that no one may boast. You and I are people of grace. And it is God's grace that carries us. So, the question then is how will we respond to this grace? I love what Augustine says. He says, God gives where he finds empty hands. Are you willing to empty your hands? Are you willing to surrender, to let go of your pride, to let go of your shame, to let go of your guilt? Are you willing to let go? Empty your hands so that the grace of God may be poured upon you. How will you respond today to him? As, I, as we close, I'd like to actually share a story. This is a person that you know very well. An, another man, a broken, fallen man who was caught and called by grace. John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, was a slave trader who had lived his life at sea from age 11. He had a reputation, which was shocking, given for his peers as a man of profanity, coarseness, and debauchery, and what's more, John Newton had a reputation as the great blasphemer. He had grown up with a Christian mom, and he hated it. And so he chose that it was his mission to convince everybody else to turn away from being a Christian. This was John Newton. But one day, during his return voyage to England, Newton was caught in a severe storm. His ship was certain to, to sink, and he was going to drown. He was going to die. But in an act of desperation, Newton began to cry out to God in the dark. And although he was convinced that he, was already, he had already sinned too much, that he had no hope, he asked God anyway for forgiveness and for help. And amazingly, Newton survived, 
It began a long journey as a disciple of Jesus and later on as a minister. But Newton never forgot how wretched a sinner he was. And so on his tombstone, he made this inscription. He wrote this inscription to describe himself, his own story. John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was, by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. As we end, I would like to just sing that good old song, Amazing Grace, one time and we will close. I don't know if that key is right. Father, we thank you for this grace. We thank you that, God, it will take our entire lives for us to know your grace, the immensity of your grace, bit by bit. Because, God, as we see our sins and our brokenness every single day, how we fall short every single day, God, you are not there shaking your head pointing the finger and condemning us. Lord, you are there inviting us into your arms. Embracing us with your love. Saying, my child, my grace is here for you. Lord, help us to believe even when we doubt. Lord, help us to receive and let go of the things that we're holding on to so dearly, Lord God, apart from you. God, I pray that every single person in this room would experience your life transforming grace. And Lord, that they would be empowered by your grace to go and share the beautiful hope that they themselves have received. Lord, we love you and we pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen. All right, church, uh, in a moment, we're about to take communion. If I can, if I can actually get a communion cup, Jacob. Uh, if you need a communion cup like I, I just do right now, would you ask Jacob and he'll get one for you. But take this time for a moment to respond. And take this time, if you have your communion cups already, to just pray and to just reflect on the grace of God for you and to talk to him. The Lord, his throne is open to you, church. And then we will come back and take communion together. on the night when our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me, church, the body of Christ.
And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This is Christ's blood shed for us. Church, the blood of Christ. Let's continue with worship. So this is a new song that I want to introduce to you. It's basically the whole topic of the song. That everything we ever done and accomplished it came from God first. The song comes from Ephesians 2. It says, Oh by God. I was born. my need for a Savior, oh my God, I crushed by the weight of my feet, leaving the lie I created, digging my grave without knowing, oh my God, oh my God, reaching mercy, how you love me too much to let me stay lost. My salvation sent from heaven near my sin to a cross. my sure testimony over God over God reach in mercy how you love me so much let me stay lost my salvation sent from heaven in my sin to a cross over
give us grace. Thank you so much for being an active God and standing out in our sin and just giving us hope to live with you free forever. Thank you, amen. Okay. You may be seated for just a moment. Um, so, uh, yeah, I just want to take a moment and just say thank you again, team, for everything that you've done. Um, just want to encourage you guys to continue. Uh, I just want to say this. Guys, this is not, so now that we're here in this space, doesn't mean that there's going to be less work or ministry for us to do. There's, there's going to be more opportunities for ministry and outreach, and I'm excited for that. But here's, the, just pastorally, one thing I'll just say is what we, what we said in, back in January, we need to focus on abiding with Jesus and being on a pace of grace and slowing down and focusing on what is truly important, your relationship with Christ. It's easy for us as a church plant to just work, work, work and get burned out. And as, a, as your pastor, I'm praying for us that we would be on that right pace for us to be able to faithfully and for the long run pursue this mission together. I'm excited for it, church. I really am. I'm excited to see the lives that will be changed this year. I'm excited to see the people that we will be able to minister to from all nations here. I'm excited for it. But Jesus says what? Abide in me and I in you. For apart from me, you can produce nothing. And so, guys, as things get busier, let's focus even more on Jesus Christ and being faithful in that relationship with him. For others of you who are new, I'm so encouraged that you're here. Thank you for being here today. I would be honored to uh, meet you and just to get to know you uh, outside or even pray for you in the hallway. And so please don't leave. We have coffee and snacks and things like that. We like to linger a lot at our church. So feel free to linger with us. We would be honored to just get come alongside you in whatever way we can. All right. Uh, all right. As we close, I would actually like to read 1 Peter 1 through 2 again. And I'll pray for us and we'll be dismissed. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a great week. I was running wild.